<sighs> Just like that, I'm 12 again. Hey folks, I'm CPC Gamer, and welcome to Let's Play Light Crusader, a 1995 Mega Drive game by Treasure. The last Mega Drive game by Treasure, before they started developing for the Saturn, in fact. But that's a story for another day, so let's start telling this one. So I think I'm... <laughs> by the way, spoilers, this is how long it takes to beat the game. I'm going to pick slot 4. Because nobody picks slot 4, so let's give that some time in the sun. Also, where are we? Who are you? Who is they? And why do you want revenge? This is storytelling at its finest. Now, see, that guy's name is actually Kazuhiko Ishida. How do you translate that to Koenig? Because that, that is a very German name. Oh, and that guy didn't do anything. He was just his moral support. Like, he was a cheerleader. Hi, David! Aren't there supposed to be, like, tree sprites behind you in this scene? Because you, you look like you're flying. Anyways, regular viewers will know how I like to talk about version differences in the games that I'm playing. We're gonna have a field day with this- Oh! Oh, I saw you reloop on the right there, David! Nice work! Anyways, we're gonna have fun with this one, because there are six English localizations for this game. America, England, Japan, and Korea each got one. The Wii Virtual Console got one, a mixture of UK and US versions. And the Steam version got a tweaked version of the one that the console uses, the Virtual Console. It is really bloody complicated, basically, um, but it means I have a lot to talk about, so... Winner! Now, we're playing using a European revision of the script, and you can tell because David talked about Endless Battle, which he doesn't do in the American one, and just now he's talked about visiting Green Row, while the version I played talked about the village of Green Rod. Hell yeah, we've got Akihara on the soundtrack. It's gonna be a good time. Ah, the townspeople seemed to be. How very deep. Oh, right, the, the, the text keeps going. Okay. It, it goes on for a while, actually, but... You know, since this is a mid-90s treasure game, there's not masses of plot, and it is pretty much all front-loaded. Like, the game is very chatty now, but it quickly goes away and sort of leaves you to your own devices. And it's kind of weird for an RPG, but I'm actually pretty okay with that. You know, just, here is your mission, off you go. I'm not okay with the character portrait for David, though. Like, he, he looks like a pirate or a goblin or something. Is that foreshadowing? Probably. I also like that sign-off line. I certainly will. Like, I don't know why, it just tickles me. Also, yeah, we're in control now. So first things first, we're gonna pause. We're gonna go this way. So we can turn on the damage numbers and turn off item auto use. It'll save us such a big headache in the long run. Now, controls-wise, and something I like about this game, we have all the tools at our disposal right away. So we can move, and we can jump, and we can slash. And when we find it, we can cast magic. But first, let's explore the castle a little bit, so to see if we can meet the people that we're helping. So this is Kettlewell, the dangerous chef. And as with many games, you are told that fire is indeed hot. Oh, also, don't eat other people's food, I guess. That's fine, I'm just saving everyone's lives! Oh yeah, you can push NPCs around in this game. <laughs> this comes in very handy later on. Anyways, this is the Oracle, and she has a number of pre-baked lines that give you clues as to what you're supposed to do next. Now, none of them really helped me when I was younger, but pay attention to that one about disturbing the dead. So door number three houses something we can't use just yet, so let's go behind the bushes here and collect ourselves a hidden pendant. Pendants revive us when we die, and this will happen maybe once in the entire playthrough. Although probably more if I keep looking at my notes instead of at the screen. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Oh hey, I didn't know I was in this game. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. So, 
Um, so the, the game uses the same button for attacking and talking, and that little oops thing flashes up to show that you attacked somebody friendly. Now in the American version, this fellow says that Cullen has vanished, not Alan. And it's a subtle change, but an important one, which we will learn about later in the game. I'm just going to shuffle you over there. Now, as I go in here, I'm going to go quiet for a bit. Just, just take a listen to the music that's playing in here. It's that one track from Final Fantasy X, except it's six years earlier. Like, I don't know how nobody noticed that. Probably because this is a pretty obscure game. And speaking of obscure things and making really good links in your game commentary, here is a secret. If we attack here, nothing. But if we attack here, you hear that pinging? That's because we are attacking a door. The door to the debug room, specifically. And it's weird they didn't remove it. They just left the black door sprite on a black backdrop so you can't see it. And it's functional, too. Like, if you hack a particular key into your inventory, you can just go in and out as you please. It's pretty cool. Now, back to what we can see. This is a unique painting, which makes me want to say that this is somebody from a treasure game. And if you bear with me, I will show you why. If we go to the last house over here... This is Melon Bread, a boss from two of Treasure's other games, Gunstar Heroes and Alien Soldier. And if we go down here to the pub, which is a, a longer walk than I had anticipated... Look, it's Beano from Dynamite Hitty! I love it when game companies do stuff like that! Oh, also, I have to talk to this guy. This cracked me up when I first played the game, and it still does now. Eventually. His name is Shrug Shoulder! Like, that's not even a joke, but I love it. And in the American version, he just questions why he hasn't been kidnapped yet, which... I mean, it's thematically appropriate, but it's also kind of boring. And this guy here, well... I mean, he's just worried about his cows, so... What a hero! Now, the last stop on our tour is, rather fittingly, the Graveyard. Also the site of the game's very first puzzle. Also the site of the very first stumbling block that stopped my progression when I first played this game. So given the clues that we've had, what do you think we need to do? Like, do you think it has anything to do with this obvious trapdoor? And the obvious drag marks beside this tombstone that, when you interact with it, reveals a hidden staircase? Like, 12-year-old me was not the smartest. I had to call up my friend Chris to help with that one. Like, it's not even the hardest puzzle this game has, but, you know, there we go. But, wouldn't you know it, there is a dungeon beneath Green Row. Like, you'd think somebody would have noticed this at some point, but apparently not, so here we are. Oh, and as soon as you build a dungeon, monsters move in. That's, that's like the circle of life or something. The combat in this game is a very zelda -y affair, in that we basically just swing our sword around in the air, and if any part of any enemy happens to fill that air, then it's their own fault. And there's a pretty cool magic system too, as I've mentioned, and the game does a pretty good job of requiring it at certain points, which I think is a pretty good thing. And this is a puzzle room. This door here is locked, and in order to open it, we have to hit it with some environmental object. Like in this case, a medieval laser beam that totally existed back in the day, you don't even know. Um, and occasionally you'll have to do a pressure plate puzzle or a small arena fight like this one, but your basic bread and butter puzzle room is hit the door with something to unlock it. Because, I mean, if, if you can just come and go as you please, then the game's kind of short. So... Yeah. Okay, it's time to demo this earlier than I thought I'd need to. <laughs> we restore health by going to our inventory and eating food. Now, each of these food items restores a different amount of health, 
and they are pretty much what you would expect. Small stuff restores 10, while the big stuff nets you 60 to 100. The combat in this game has a couple of extra facets that I didn't mention. Um, so you've got this jumping lunge attack, which does a bit of extra damage but leaves you wide open. And if you're able to attack an enemy from behind, you'll do a guaranteed critical hit. But, I mean, that's too much effort because the enemies can all turn on the spot like you can. <laughs> and that is why, even now, 20 years later, my mom calls this game the horrible one where you chop people's heads off. Like, she was not a fan of this game for that very reason. But, like, I, I don't know. I thought it was cool. I don't see what the problem was. I didn't then, either, because it's... Like, it's cartoon violence, you know? Nobody's getting hurt, it's just... Comedy Tom and Jerry getting hit with sticks sort of thing, you know? Oh, and this is a very difficult puzzle, by the way. You, you open the door with the door opener. Top level Light like Crusader strats right there. So when I was a kid, I would fight every enemy every time I passed through every room. But with that said, you, you kind of don't need to. Also, hi. <laughs> that's kind of ruined something that's coming up shortly, so... You know, where to throw me a curveball game? I didn't know the green slimes even dropped that. Now, here's another tricky puzzle. You have to put the thing on the thing. Although, with that said, the isometric viewpoint does get a, a little bit screwy sometimes. Oh, that's a neat little touch! There's meant to be another sphere on this little pillar over here, but because I already picked one up, it doesn't need to spawn. That's pretty neat. So, those are the four elements that make up everything in the world. Or it's this game's magic system. We have air, fire, water, <laughs> earth, and really finicky controllers. Now, you can equip each of these individually, but you can also combine them for additional effects. And some of them make sense, um, like Earth and Fire make Meteor, but some of them less make less sense, like Earth and Water make Fairy, apparently. Ah, whatever, I'll keep her. She doesn't do much, but I like having her around. Now, in the past, I have been pretty harsh on that message, a door opens somewhere. Thank you, game. Could you please be less vague? But, to be fair, it doesn't really need to be. Because the door that opened is this one, right here. And since that door is progression, let's do anything but use that door. For example, let's do these deceptively tricky isometric jumps to get used to the way David moves in this particular game. Maximum life! And that's the equivalent of a heart container from Zelda. Uh, it boosts your maximum HP by one pip. Also, I like the other thing that increases your life bar is the literal HUD element used to indicate life. Like, it's a it's a dumb little fourth wall thing. There we go. That shouldn't be a tricky jump, is it? Now, in this room, we have a prisoner. Let's free him, how about? There are a number of these guys dotted around the dungeon, and each time you free one, they go back to green row. You can even find them and have a chat. Also, I thought he said something if you spoke to him twice. Apparently, I was wrong. Now, you'll find these rest areas around the dungeon, too. They contain either a healing fountain, a save point, or a magical third option that I will explain when I find it in the hope that this vagary will hold your attention a little bit longer. Now, let's move on. Oh yeah, that thing I was talking about! There are certain fights you have to do in order to open certain doors, but if the game doesn't say BEAT THEM when you enter a room, you can just go through and ignore it. Now there are some enemies that you can use for grinding out healing items, and some that have very rare drops, including these lily pads. Now they have the chance to drop the gold armor, which is the best armor in the game. And it's ridiculous that you can get it like, what will be, 15 minutes into the game? Now, the caveat with that is that the gold armor is a random drop, so you can fight these guys for hours, or days even, and still not manage to get the armor from them. 
Also, why is this now so much easier now that I don't have the Guardian magic going? Like, she's meant to help me, but she just sort of made things worse. Alright, on with the game. Answer the, riddle. Answer the riddle, you say? I think I just might. Do you think it has anything to do with the only interactable objects in the room? You betcha! Alright, let's see what we scored. Nice! Oh, and it's this room! Okay, this cat is important for two reasons. First, it is one of only two places where you can sell your inventory, which is the only way to get rid of stuff outside of using it. Second, this is an absurdly well-localized cat. So depending on the game's language setting, it will say meow, 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 yaong, or nya. I studied languages at college, and I chose to use it on sentences like that one. Take it, and do with it as you wish. Now let's push on through the rest of the dungeon. This is a save point. We don't need to use that, we'll be fine. Although, let's top up on health. I thought I had more food than that. Ah, whatever, we'll be fine. Even though we're facing down our first boss, the color out of space! Now I have to say, it's a pretty tough first boss, because even though the boss doesn't move, every one of its attacks does, and they move at random, so the only real course of action is, go where the projectiles aren't. Nice, we're having that though. Now your strategy here is to hit the boss in the giant glowing eye that serves as its weak spot, just like Resident Evil would have done. You can also destroy the projectiles, and as with that last phase, sometimes you have to destroy the projectiles, but for the most part you can just wail away on the boss. Oh and how's that? It's down to its actual visible health bar! So the health bar indicates 200 HP, just like it does with David. But I don't think there's a single boss in the game that only has 200 HP, so you have to damage them a whole bunch before you can even see that you're making a dent in their health. And if you want to, like, start dropping additional healing items, that would be great. Warrior needs food badly. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm out now. Great. You know what the depressing thing is? This wasn't even the boss I was expecting to die to. There's this one on level 5 that is a nightmare. This guy's just kind of, like, awkward in the grand scheme of things. So one of the reasons this guy is giving me so much grief, along with the trio of goblins we fought earlier on, is because in the European release, which serves as the basis for this version, David takes additional damage until you find better armor. And I know... I know, I know, localization, Johns, but there it is. I mean, presumably they did it so you begin the game feeling quite weak, and subsequently feel the benefit when you do get the better equipment later on. But, I mean, it's still a weird choice, because it could very easily put people off playing the game. Oh, jeez, and I thought I was doing well enough to avoid this one. So that's the boss's desperation attack, which means I've got it down to about a quarter of its health, and it really doesn't like that. Also, yeah, I have run out of healing items, so <laughs> enjoy me dying to the first boss! <laughs> I mean, no, enjoy me giving you a demonstration of what happens when you die and resurrect, because that is a thing that I absolutely meant to do, and... Yeah, I'm not even going to try to throw down the first try card here, because that was just... Oh, good lord, that was bad. <laughs> what do we have here? Maximum life! It really is like a heart container from Zelda, since you very frequently get one after every major boss fight. And we also got Key 2, which is pretty much useless, and I will show you for why. Right after, I steal whatever this is. So, Key 2 opens this door, which is kind of redundant because 
you're only going to go that way after fighting the boss, which makes that door open automatically, because you take the west-facing exit, so it's, it's... It's a weird little quirk. Now, I'm going to kill these guys, and hopefully get some more food out of it. I'm going to open that door like a regular human being. <laughs> like, doesn't everybody do a sick lunge and jam their key into the hole like that? Because I know I do. Now, the... Them. Actually, no, wait a second, because you can do a pretty cool trick with this fight. If you combine three elements, specifically which ones I forget, but you know what? The version of the game I played had this option where you could make the spells appear on the right-hand side of the screen, and the game would automatically mix them for you if you had the right elements. I've never been able to recreate this. Anyways, Wind, Earth, Water gets you Turn on Dead, which instantly dismisses any undead enemy in the game. And having done that, all we need to do is to fight this wizard. Now, for this fight, at least, it's a lot easier to get rid of the adds, because you can't hurt the skeletons at all, and they have really strong projectile attacks. But if you don't use magic, however, the skeletons will all die once the magician is defeated. Oh, and this vector laser is not our friend. You want to avoid that mess. And this is a little chunk of the boss that we just fought. I like it as a narrative device, because it... It kind of does make you think that they're doing the color out of space. Like the giant meteor has had some insidious influence, including making smaller versions of itself. I think that's pretty good. I'll be honest, that's not what's going on, but, you know, it, it's, it's a good thought. Also, special thanks to Donkey Kong for letting us borrow his blast barrel tech, because with that, now we can get through the door. Now, which way do I need to go? I think it's this way? Maybe? No, it's not. But let's rescue the maiden while we're here. Let's rescue Bonnie Tyler, apparently. And why not? Because holding out for a hero is absolutely fantastic in almost any context. Now, what is this, game designers? That's right, the game has tutorialized pressure plates and blast barrels, and now we are expected to combine the two. In a, in a really friggin' awkward way, because this game doesn't like moving stuff orthogonally. <laughs> there. Excellent! Now, I suppose I should probably explain what's going on here. You know, like, why Light Crusader? Well... Yeah, now's a good time, because I'm bad at platforming. So, many years ago, I was introduced to the concept of Let's Play as a video format when somebody linked me to some kid playing Mega Man 2, because, frankly, doesn't everybody. I'll be honest with you guys, it wasn't very good. Every cardinal sin of mic etiquette and editing, this guy did. But, in the related section, YouTuber Duke of the Bump was doing Light Crusader, and... I love this game! I played the hell out of this when I was a teenager! So, based on that, I watched his series, which got me into the LP community, which got me making videos of my own, which led to this point right here, where I'm playing Light Crusader in my own right, and you are listening to me explain that. It's like a little tribute act, you know? Just call me... The, um... I mean, Duke of the Bump is already taken. Like, that that's a tribute to King of the Hill, so I'm gonna be... Contessa of the Mount. That is awful. Give me time to work on that. Also, I hate that stupid windy corridor. Like, there's no puzzle, just we are going to make it so you take four times as long to walk along this straight line. Also, this is how I've always solved this puzzle. Like, I don't know what these other two sliding blocks are for, because the bomb gets enough inertia when you push it off the top shelf that you can just... Do it in one go. Oh, and it's these guys again. Disclaimer, I'm going to be grinding the hell out of those enemies in between videos, in the hopes that I get the golden armor. And frankly, if the rest of the game goes anything like that first boss, I'm probably going to need it. 
Now this one is a pretty simple puzzle in theory, but... You know, there are those words, in theory. <laughs> the sliding block can only move in straight lines, whereas this rotary arm can move freely. And the trick is keeping the one on top of the other, which... As you've seen, is... Kinda hard. So let's try that one again. Maybe let's get it right this time. I mean, at the very least, I know to use the rotary arm this time. When I played this game as a teenager, I tried to push the block across it in one go, rather than swinging it around to the pressure plate. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. There we go! So something that I appreciate is that this game knows that it has weird physics, and it isn't afraid to take advantage of that. Well, let's not take the stairs, I guess, because... Someone's blocking it, so... Let's keep moving forward. And that last ghost can stay alive. Undead. Whatever. It will serve as the warning to the others. And I'm not entirely sure, but I think this is where I want to go next. Because my notes kind of stopped after the wizard boss fight, so I'm, I'm just sort of winging it right now. Now, to be fair, this is the kind of game where you need to explore almost every room, so I'll probably need to come this way eventually, I just want to do this with the optimal route, you know? Alright, let's get you going, and see what's behind the magical mystery door! Now the blasts from those barrels are always bigger than I think they are, so you'll probably see me get hit by at least one during this playthrough. Also, heck yeah, I got me a new sword! I'm gonna equip the hell out of that! This is the Rapier, which survived translation intact. That's what it's called in Japanese. I mean, a lot of the equipment has the same name in Japanese and English. Really, they just truncated it sometimes. For example, Japan has the Kaiser Knuckle, and in England, it was just called Kaiser. Are these guys firing randomly? I, I feel like they're firing randomly. Answer the riddle. Now, you may recall, the last time we had to answer the riddle, we had a bunch of lamps on. How about this time, we have a bunch of lamps off? Yeah, there we go! <laughs> Fun fact, there's a second hidden door in that room, but there's no way of triggering it, just like the one in the graveyard. Did I mention the one in the graveyard? I don't think I did. But, for now, that's not important, because now it's time for boss number two! There's no official listing for what the enemy's names are, but there is a debug menu that links you to this scene, and it calls this enemy... Dragon. I know, right? It's absolutely groundbreaking. I gotta say, though, it's kinda weird to me that this game doesn't have a list of enemy names, because... A, that was the style at the time. There'd be a full list of enemy names, either in the manual or like a post credit sequence. And B, Treasure is the king of making up awesome names for its enemies. You ever play Alien Soldier? Because that has some of the best. Like, they've got Sniper Honey Viper and Sunset Sting. And, like, aren't they just the coolest names? They sound like finishing moves. You know, it's a Sunset Sting from the top rope! I love it, Michael! You know? But, none of that in this game. This guy is... It's just a dragon. Now, its main attack is the perspective, because it can be very hard to tell whether it's high in the air or just far away. Which, I mean, it's one of the problems with isometric games like this one, I suppose. But we're doing pretty well, so come here, you! One more. Oh, and he's got the magic pixel! Come on, game, I had that! And I meant to fall off the platform like a cool guy. I meant to do that. Ah, oh, well. I think I'm going to call it here. So join us next time for more Light Crusader. And until next time, goodbye!